Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I apologize for the delay in getting started. I was trying to get a link set up in the, um, in the description for the video because I have finished a bunch of color thumbnails. So previously you were watching me doing uh, black and white thumbnails. Oh, I forgot. Simple introductions. How rude of me. I'm Jeremy. I am a self-publishing comic book artist, writer, and I share my creative process, writing, drawing, creating comics here online, live with you. If you'd like to support this channel, get additional bonus videos, see bonus behind-the-scenes blog posts and content, you can go to patreon.com slash Jeremy, and that's G-E-R-I-M-I. If you would like to read some of my comic books for free, preview, get a look and see, at the work, see what the finished product looks like, you can read free previews at comics.jeremy.net. There's some PDFs that you can download. There's previews for every issue of, uh, of my book so far. And if you'd like to buy some of my comics, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. That link will take you to my Amazon page where you can buy my trades of my current series, Morning Star, which is Lucifer's Fall from Heaven, told as a Western. You can also buy my previous graphic novel, Eye of the Gods, and also some other books I've worked on. Uh, an art book that I've published, a anthology called Samurai, the comic that I have contributed to. And, uh, okay. So, as I was saying, previously I was drawing black and white thumbnails for the cover images for the final issue of Morningstar, issue eight, which I'm starting to work on now. Let me grab my little color sketchbook. So there should be a link in the description for the video asking which thumbnail should be the cover for the comic. So I finished doing some color thumbnails. And let me bring the camera down so you guys can get a little closer look at this. I see Aaron in the chat. Hey, thanks for dropping by. How you doing? Just going through some, uh, some thumbnails here. So there should be a link in the chat and that link will take you to my Patreon page where all these images are there and you can vote on which one you think should be the cover for the final issue. So I've got one thumbnail, it just says Lucifer writing towards the camera head on. He's flanked by a uh, fellow rebel angel riding a demon. I mean, you, they're thumbnails, you can't really tell all that detail. I'm just giving you some context. But um, Lucifer with a fellow rebel angel riding a demon and then a demon riding a, a horse, kind of like symbolizing the unification, how he's brought these two factions together and is now bringing them back to invade heaven. The second one, same composition, but instead of the sun rising behind him, which kind of ties in with the theme of Morningstar, instead I just have the burning behind him and you can have seeing heaven on fire and a burning behind them. Then another one, which is, again, the same concept, but simply rendered at a Dutch angle for a little bit more sense of a drama. And, you know, obviously the positions of the different demons and angels are different because they fit into the composition differently. Then, I've got a thumbnail of Lucifer simply just falling into the darkness, his wings on fire and him kind of blazing a trail of fire into the darkness as he falls, his hat kind of falling to the side. An image of Lucifer pointing his gun at the viewer, just sort of off to off side of the uh, the actual, you know, off panel to the side, but he's on fire, burning. And then I just did this image twice because I didn't really like the way the rent. I just didn't really like the color pose the first time I did it. But it's Lucifer and Michael at a kind of a standoff head to head, you know, their guns in each other's faces. But then also there's tiny buildings in there, like they're giants up here. And then there's tiny buildings in the foreground on top of the buildings on the roof. There's a couple of angels on Michael's side taking pot shots at some demons that are on the roof of this other building on uh, Lucifer's side. So those are the different ideas I have. Um, let me know if the link shows up. It should just say um, which 
cover thumbnail do you think she, which thumbnail do you think should be the cover for the final issue of Morningstar? So I tried to uh, get that on there and post it right before starting the video, hence it being a minute or two late before I uh, got started. Which is funny, because usually if I'm a little bit late, Ion Rocks is on there like, hey man, you doing a live stream today? So I was rushing to get, d get ready before he showed up to, uh, to spank me. Anyway, so where are we at today? I have finished the cover thumbnails, and whichever one everyone votes on liking the most, I will move on to working on the cover for. I'll probably do a couple of value studies, and I don't know, I might even actually do the cover first. I'm not sure, I haven't decided yet. But, we're still in the thumb node, thumbnail phase. I haven't even begun my lettering. So the next step here, I guess, is moving into actually thumbnailing the, the issue. So let me grab my thumbnails. So, as I've mentioned in recent videos, I've taken to a new process for thumbnailing where I just thumbnail one image on a card, and that one image should represent the entire page. So, I'm not actually, th I start by trying to do, I end up doing this for the entire issue. So, I'll have a stack of cards that just has every single page in the story. And the idea is that if I can make the story seem to flow just with a pile of cards that just has one dominant image to tell the story, if all the pieces link up, then going in and, and linking together the individual panels within a page should, in theory, flow a little bit better, be a little bit easier. I've kind of worked out any big major problems, which it's good that I did this because I realized that this issue is actually going to be Almost, I think I mentioned this last week, but it's going to be almost double sized, 40 pages, which usually my issues are 24 pages. But it's my comic. It's the final issue. There's certain scenes I don't want to cut from the story. So even though it's going to take me longer to draw it, I realize this is my last chance to wrap up and say everything I want to say about this story the way I want to. I mean, unless I come up with an idea for a, a sequel or an expanded thing. I mean, it was almost enough content to go for another uh, another issue. If I had another eight pages, then I probably would just break it into two issues. But I really don't want to pad the story. So, and I didn't want to give any like two undersized issues. So I just decided, all right, this final issue is just going to be double sized. Um, let's see here. So. Let's bring the camera back out again. So really at this point, you know what? I can bring it back down because I realized I don't need these cover images that are off to the side anymore. So I can just take my couple of different versions of page one and lay those out. Let's move these cover images off to the side. I'm gonna get a different cork board because this is actually kind of a pain in the ass having this, the way this strip ling lays down the page. Uh. All right. So really, I just need my thumbnails for page one and page two at the moment and just figure out how the two, uh, how they sync up. Do I think I'll get to page three? Possibly. Well, they'll be here at the side for me to grab them if I need them. All right. Let's 
Got my other pages up above. Let's grab a piece of uh, scratch paper and get going. Normally I like to thumbnail using a brush just to keep my hand a little bit fluid when I'm not in the middle of inking an issue. So I usually like to thumbnail with an ink and a brush. But being that I didn't have a chance to really set up beforehand the way I usually prefer to, I am just gonna use a water brush instead. So. And my handy dandy outline, I need thy outline. I might have things sort of thought out visually, but it's still important for me to just sort of look at the story beats in terms of what's going on dialogue wise. All right. So basically, at the end of the previous issue of Morning Star, Lucifer shot Michael and he fell off a cliff into the darkness, into the water. And basically he's underwater, sort of drowning, self-pitying himself. And as I look at this, I realize I kind of wrote it to be a splash page. So, so far, that's one page down because this thumbnail pretty much cover, other than the fact that I would actually need to work on what the position, the pose is, this thumbnail pretty much covers what I need page one to be. So for page two, let's bring this down here so I can look at this while I'm doing it and you can kind of see what I'm working with. So with page two, get this brush pen going. And really a lot of it is just loose Michael floating underwater in the dark. So I guess from that first thumbnail where he's tiny, what I would probably do, sometimes I like to start with just a simple grid. So I forgot what is the beginning, the middle and the end of the page. And one of the things I like to do sometimes is start at the end and work backwards. So I know that the last, the last image really is that's gonna be, it's not gonna be, this page is not gonna be nine panels, but I'll put a nine panel grid in here just for the sake of messing around with visually what's gonna be happening on the page, which is a panel of darkness, Panel of darkness. Panel with a light glow in the darkness. Light glow continues. Light glow gets bigger bigger until finally it's blinding white. So that's what's going to happen visually across the page. Now the way I have it currently outlined, I have it for five panels instead of nine. So then just becomes a matter of combining these images and how I want to, uh, to do that visually. See, Ian Rocks is in the, uh, the chat. Um, said pretty awesome, Jeremy. 
thank you. By the way, is that link to the uh, the color thumbnails in the description for the video? If you don't mind, just checking real quick. I um I finished color thumbnails for the cover to the final issue, and I put a link in there. Which, by the way, if anyone's watching the replay of the video later on, please feel free to vote. It should take you to a poll on my Patreon page. It's a public poll. Um. My page does say when you go there that you need to be 18 or over to view it. That's only because I put figure drawings on there which have nudity in it. Patreon has these weird clauses where just any type of nudity, they're they're concerned about it being adult. So I just set my, as opposed to getting dinged or penalized for putting content on there when I'm not properly categorized, I just set it to an 18 or over page so I can post whatever figure drawings I want. But no, it is not a link to try and get you to sign up for porn. It is just my artwork, which some people might find a little bit horrific, but I certainly don't think it's pornographic. Um, all right, so where was I? Yes, the lighting of the page. So for this, I suppose I can start with what the final image is. And really, I actually, this is something else I do, is if I'm doing a page, I've got a character upside down, which happens a couple of times in Morningstar, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll flip the page upside down and do the thumbnail upside down. I'm not that great at looking at something upside down and drawing it. And I know that that sounds like, well, duh, just turn the page upside down. Like what I'm doing sounds like common sense, but you would be surprised how many years I spent where I was struggling trying to get something to look the way I wanted to while drawing it upside down. And mind you, I take figure drawing classes and there's times where models take poses where they are upside down, their heads upside down, maybe they're laying on their back, but they're facing you um, with their head towards the floor. Or, you know, some models being super flexible and able to take daring poses, hold them for a while. They'll have poses where they're, you know, they're upside down. Maybe they're on their back with their legs over their head. Um, and those are challenging, and it's good to, to take on challenges like that. But when I'm doing something like I'm just thumbnailing, it's probably way easier. I, no probably is about it. It's definitely way easier to just draw the thing, turn the page over, draw the thing upside down, and then when I'm done, turn it back. So... I probably want to have Michael's hand a little bit more covering his face protectively. Get his little fro in there in the back. I guess the real challenge for this page is figuring out what the the images leading up to this blinding light are supposed to be because I sort of have in the thumbnail that that's pretty much the dominant image is when the light is really getting, is when it's starting to get bright. But at this point, you know, he started out in the blackness of underwater and even underwater, he's got this l blinding light just radiating all over him from underwater. So let's say that there is the final issue of the page. In theory, I could just have it take up this whole bottom tier. And then just have all of the other conversations before. It really depends. And, you know, I go back and forth. It's one of those things where having a, a character having a conversation with God while he's underwater drowning and bleeding to death. Conceptually, very interesting. But it's just a matter of positioning things such that it also has the same level of visual interest. And, you know, it's just something simple like this, the page slowly going from dark to light. I think that has enough visual interest, so I want to make sure I pick shots that... 
that complement this simplicity of this grid. It's kind of one of those things that I've been thinking about a lot more in terms of trying to improve both my storytelling and draftsmanship. Pardon me while I take a sip of water. It's hard to talk comics without talking about Jack Kirby. And for one of the things that I think about in terms of trying to make my storytelling dynamic is that for all of the really innovative page layouts that we have in comics these days, um, I mean, even since like the, well, I really think of like in the 70s and 80s when like, you know, when Neil Adams was becoming real inventive, when Jim Steranko, I think Steranko was earlier than the, the 70s, but um, you know, when you look at Jim Steranko, Neil Adams, and then you go on to like Walt Simonson, John Byrne, and all the artists post that like image creators doing really innovative page layouts, as cool as those are, when you think back to Jack Kirby, Jack Kirby's comics felt like a feature film that you were reading on the page. And um, at the same time, they were most of the part, even if you had characters breaking the panel borders, they were just nine, they were just six panel grids. You know, a large majority of, uh, of Kirby comics were just one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, sometimes he'd merge a tier and have a large one across the middle, you know. And of course, sometimes he'd have something where he'd have like maybe four large ones on top and then like a large or two small at the bottom. Point being is that Kirby told amazingly dynamic stories because what was happening inside of the panels were dynamic. And it's not that I have anything against dynamic page layouts or innovative page layouts. It's that my first and foremost goal is to tell dramatic imagery, tell a dramatic story with pictures within those panels. So I'm starting with, again, with grids, very, very simple. And then from there, trying to, if the story, if the page warrants it, then I get playful with the panels. I see Vince, my buddy Vince Morris popped in on the chat. He said, uh, this is also a chance to play with your lettering options to achieve the effects you're after. That is true, that is true. That's one of the main reasons why after I finish my thumbnails, I do my lettering based on these thumbnails. So I just create a panel or I open a, uh, a page. It has the, the page borders on the dimensions of a comic book page. And I draw in the boxes that will be the panels based on how I lay them out in my thumbnails. Then I letter those thumbnails and I draw my actual layouts where I'm really working out the, the anatomy and the, the actual proportion for the final page. They're basically, my layouts are more like rough pencils. And that's when I really get, but I draw those into pages that are already lettered. Now, obviously that lettering doesn't have to be final. I leave myself some room because every time I come in and I touch the page, I do a little bit of editing. I may change a word here, a line there as they occur to me. That said, being able to let the lettering and the visuals interplay with each other a little bit more. I may decide, oh, if I'm telling this with the visuals, I can do something different with the lettering. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be how, this character's A's, A's line, character's B's, B's line. Character speaks, character responds. Character speaks, character responds. Um, I could do different things with, um, with caption boxes. I can have characters saying one thing while they're thinking another. You know, all tried and true comic book storytelling techniques but I like to make myself, give myself the option to use those, those techniques. So let's see. So basically the actual story theme in here, the story beat that I'm trying to convey in this one page as things get lighter and darker is that Michael is first now I am going to go ahead and draw it upside down. But first, he's underwater feeling like he's dead. Then, let's turn him to a profile, even though he's not going to be full profile in the book. I mean, in the page. But eyes closed. Get his afro in there. Then he turns to face this bright light, and it's God telling him, I'm not done with you. 
then he turns away from God. So I have him turning back the other way, just slightly, not fully away, but just a little bit back. And basically he says, let me die. I've been betrayed and shot by my best friend. Um, everyone I know and love is being killed. He's just like, this, whatever was supposed to happen, this is broken. I'm broken. I'm done. Let me die. And that's when you get back to this shot, which is going to be the final shot on the page, where God's like, you might be done with me, but I'm not done with you. So... And to be honest, that could just be done across one, two, I just have that across three panels here. So it's really just a matter of how I want to break up these story beats along one page. Because the fact that it's five panels, the way I have it written right now, and that's another thing, just because my script, I, I my, my, uh, my outline says that it's five panels. If I need an extra panel, I'll toss it in there. Or if I'm like, this page works with four panels, I'll take another one away. Um, obviously if I were working with a writer, that's something I would consult them about. And if you're working and you know, if you're working with a writer that trusts you and says, as long as you capture the main points of the story, please feel free to change stuff. You know, being that it's my own story, I certainly don't feel beholden to draw exactly what I've written. You know, it's definitely different when you're working with a collaborator. There should be an equal amount of respect for both what the, the story they've laid down as well as your visual storytelling of what you're trying to communicate. But in my case, because I am said writer, if I wanted something different, I'm just going to make it different. So another thing that I do is once I realize what the beats are that I need to communicate, then I can look at it and say, all right, what if I start, again, simple grid, but bottom tier this image, making it widescreen, have it take the entire tier. Tier two and tier three, again, simple grid, but now it's just one, two, three, four, five. So a lot of times for me, thumbnailing is, sometimes the actual drawing part is the least important. For me, it ends up being writing plus math. And not in a bad way. I know as soon as I start talking about math as an artist, you're like, ugh. But it comes down, well, let me put it down here. For me, thumb, this is going to be in my blog. I'm just writing it down so I remember it. Thumbnails equals writing plus design plus math. That's what thumbnails are for me. The writing in the sense that you have a certain number of story beats that you are obligated to communicate in a page, whether it's by your writer or just if you're writing for yourself. But the point is you're telling a story and within, that, within this page of the story, within this segment of the story, you are obligated to, to tell some, some sort of change. Something, something, this, something in some way, the state of the story changes. You move the story forward. A is now B. B is now C. Whatever it is, that's the writing part. The design is laying them out in a way that is aesthetically pleasing. And the math is fitting in how many story points can you fit in one page? How many tells, tells the writing in an aesthetically pleasing manner? Um, Pace-wise, when I say aesthetically pleasing, that's, you know, aesthetically pleasing writing is, to me, is not just beautiful dialogue, but it's the pacing in which the story is told. In a way, for me, the pacing is almost more important because, you know, you can tell a good story without dialogue, but you can't really... Good dialogue without a story is just sort of like people saying snarky punchlines. It, it, the two don't add up. A square, 
all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. So that's sort of how I approach my thumbnailing process. And of course, Vince, with his words of wisdom, says writing is math in the sense of, well, see, that's just what I was saying. Writing is math in the sense of pacing. Pace is the rate of change in a story. That's calculus after a fashion. Yes, exactly. Um, we're both fans of the, uh, the Story Grid book by Sean Coyne. I think Vince might need to write a book called Story Calculus. So anyway, so now I've got beats and a basic layout. Again, it's five panels. I could do this multiple ways. Now I'm actually moving away from working on the book, and now I'm just sort of lecturing to you a little bit only because I feel like you can understand the moves I'm making if I talk a little bit more about my creative process. But I could just as easily do this panel where I've got, you know, Walt Simonson loves doing things where he'll have like little slices of time. Frank Miller will do that in Daredevil, did do that in the writing with Daredevil when working with David Mazzucchelli. Mazzucchelli. So it could just be one, two, three, four, five. And you know what? If the things that were happening above were incredibly quick, this particular pacing might actually work better because it gives you a sense of that staccato do 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 and then the big beat. But instead, these are actually slow moments. And because they're slow moments, I could just as easily also just do equal panels. One, two, three, four, five. I could do that. And that's not bad either. I think that what stops me from doing this layout and sticking with the simple square is that slightly longer panels will reinforce this sense that I, I threw down in this original thumbnail. The fact that he's kind of sinking down below. Because what I imagine in doing uh, these individual panels is probably something more like Hmm, I might actually, I don't know if I want to have the word balloons at the bottom because it's a little bit awkward, but that might actually be the way to go because he's going to be underwater and I definitely want to get that sense of him moving downward as opposed to upward. So, let's say... this with different degrees of light around Michael is almost what I imagine each of these beats being. And doing that in a long panel, A, you really only, if I want to do a close-up of him, I mean, I could back off and I could do something where you can still see his shoulders and his head but you have to make him a lot smaller in that page. And then this dialogue balloon would be off to the side. And while this could work, this is where sort of the art comes in. Because before we were talking about, you know, writing, design, math. The, well, this is both the art and the design, is does this feel like the story, board, story point that I want? And it doesn't. Um, going back to the nine panel grid that I originally put on there, these individual story beats feel more like an image in a nine panel grid where it's sort of a continuing repetition of the, uh, the image that I started with at the beginning of the splash page that came prior. Like where each one of these has the the proportions of a full comic book page. Because that's really, you know, when you look at it in a nine panel grid, that's what you're looking at with each panel. It's got the proportions of a, a tiny splash page. So I think something like this. And yeah, I'm not sure whether I want to have the balloons 
at the bottom of the page instead of floating the way they normally do. But it would give me some room to have Michael take up more of the space there. It'd be an awkward lettering choice. And I think what I'm probably going to have to do is, yeah, even looking at it here in thumbnails, that should be able to say, yes, it works. No, it doesn't. But a lot of times I will draw a page or maybe do the lettering. And when, once I actually am drawing into my layouts, that's where I can see whether something works or not. Of course, that's the other thing about thumbnails is that in addition to that, I can say, all right, well, what's it gonna look like if I have a character floating upside down and I put the dialogue here? I've got him talking back and forth with God. See, the reason why I don't like putting the balloons at the top where they normally would be is for the simple fact that now the balloons are crossing over his body or his body is sticking out from them. I don't know. This seems less awkward to me. I mean... Having the balloons at the bottom of the page seems less awkward to me than than having the characters, having the balloons on the character's body. And again, this is sort of the, the writing design combo what will be aesthetically pleasing in the picture, but what will also make sense narratively. You know, and just in this little thumbnail that I made here, it doesn't look horrible. It doesn't look horrible having him underneath. I mean, having the, the balloons on top of his body. It's just sort of a cleaner storytelling when they're not. So, so far... I still feel like this first one that I drew is probably closest to what I want. So now we think about the fact of, in terms of pacing, there's not just the pacing of revealing story images, but there's the pacing of sort of the, the composition. And in getting to that, what I imagine is slowly, if I'm a movie camera, pushing in on Michael. So if the first image, the splash page, is him tiny in the corner of a page, then what I would probably start with is in the, uh, if I'm using this layout, let's say panel one of the page, Let's see here. Maybe I have, you know what? Yeah, this definitely works with a panel off to the side. Actually, you know what? It doesn't even have panel off to the side because I have, whenever I have Michael, not when I have Michael, there's only two other sequences in the comic where I have God speaking. And when he does speak, he doesn't speak in word balloons. That's another thing I just remembered. He speaks, um, his, it looks like a sound effect and it's outside of the panel borders. And usually it's all, like previously I had it all white when he was speaking before. And eventually it gets lighter and lighter as he's underwater. But let's just see. I can go right, I can write on this in white real quick. But compositionally, what I started saying was pushing in. So before going to a really close-up-ish shot of Michael, framed, say, like this, let's start maybe with him. Let's say a shot that cuts him off either at the waist or mid-thigh. Mid-thigh would be better than right at the waist, but um, 
depends on whether that feels like it wastes too much space compositionally. And it's funny that I'm doing this little picture. I just realized that this, no, actually I didn't realize it because I knew it when I was drawing the thumbnails, but this image of that I'm drawing now of Michael floating upside down, I'm reusing. This image is actually what's inspired my, uh, my cover thumbnail where I have Lucifer falling into the darkness. So this is Lucifer falling, you know, falling from heaven when he's cast out. I had, I realized that that's a great, I drew that as one of my, my doodly sketches. It's actually what I have in mind for Michael when he's floating underwater. I've gone back and forth between him looking like he's falling, you know, like Lucifer was versus him just sort of a little bit of a slight fetal position curled up as he's floating underwater. But I do like that idea of reusing imagery, not out of a lack of creativity, but in terms of a repetition of a theme. But regardless, Michael floating underwater. Maybe I've got his arms off to the side a little bit. Pardon me, I yawned a little bit. It's up late last night drawing. <clears throat> you know what, and what's funny is I have found that if you spend several hours in a given day drawing, this might not be true for you, but for me, when I spend a lot of time drawing in a given day, I tend to dream about drawing. And last night, I had a dream about a version of Michael from Morningstar, the character I'm, I'm drawing right now, I had a dream of a version of him in my comics living in the future where he's now, he hasn't fallen from grace per se, but he is an angel living among men, kind of like as a, a Lazarus Methuselah type character where he's ancient and seems to be indestructible and people think he's a superhero, but actually he's a fallen angel. Which I think kind of plays into um, Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land book with his Michael character in his book, which I know I'm spoiling the hell out of it by, by relating that to the Michael in, uh, in Morningstar. But it's a great book if you haven't read it. It's sort of a, uh, an entertaining analysis of... Uh, social critique of, of society and humanity and uh, how cults and organizations can run away with us and how people are also very threatened by ideas that feel new and different to them. Um, unique ideas on, on love and relationships. Um, it's kind of like a cultural critique in the guise of uh, science fantasy. Of course, you could say that about the entire genre being a cultural critique. I mean, Star Trek did that every week. They would tell interesting stories, um, communicating and saying things about society that people might not be willing to discuss in public, but in the guise of a TV show, you could say, oh yeah, hey, this is a really interesting way to look at this, or I never looked at this group of people that way before, or I never analyzed this issue through this lens, and uh, you know, I'm not saying anything that's new or novel. I mean, many, many people, cultural critics before, have, have said far more eloquently than I about how great genre fiction is for discussing topical things about our society today in a, a fun and non-threatening guise, or even in a confrontational guise, but it's confrontational for those characters so it feels safe to explore and talk about these things. So... Let's say I'm going from like a really wide shot to now this shot here. Kind of a half shot. With God speaking in the dark. 
And the line that he has here is, this is not what I had planned for him or you, my child. He's actually responding to, like on the page before, that splash page, Michael's just like, how? How could Lucifer betray us like this? How could he betray me? Because Lucifer is his brother. And that's when God speaks back to him. And I'm not going to write out all the dialogue here. Just this is you. That's not very good. I should use something that has a little bit more of a point to it. Since I'm doing so small. This is not. Okay, and there'll be you know more dialogue in there. I may have to shift some of this dialogue to the other uh, other pages. So it'll start with Michael in darkness, God speaking back to him. Quick point on tools, because people are always asking me what I'm using, what I'm drawing, what I'm working with. Generally, I use Pentel Presto correction pens for any time I need to draw white into black because it gives me a nice solid white. And it's fairly fine point. I mean, they, they call it a fine point. It's more like using a, um, a Sharpie, like not even one of the, uh, the skinny Sharpies, but like the next size up from this, even though the tips, hey, let's do uh, tip comparisons. Even though the tip of this is comparable to the size of the tip of a... Um, a fine, um, a uh, ultra fine point Sharpie. If anything, when you actually draw with this, the kind of line that it gives you, it's kind of like just a regular Sharpie, which if you're careful with it and you have a light touch, you can get a, a decent amount of control and a, a thick to thin line. Not thick to thin, but, well, yeah, thick to thin. Well, let's see. If I'm really light, I can get a thin line with this. With my normal pressure, this is like my normal drawing pressure, and then obviously if you press down, you can get a thicker one. So you can get a thin to thick to thin. Microns aren't really made, or not microns. Microns are totally made for that. Sharpies aren't really made for that. But the only reason why I'm going into this is because I switched, when I couldn't get the writing that I wanted, I switched to a, uh, a Molotow uh, paint pen. So this is an acrylic paint pen. Um, it doesn't seem to clog up. It seems to work very, you know, very well. I haven't used it that much, but you know, I, I keep it in my uh, my uh, art inking and uh, corrective pen tools for just such an occasion. And whenever I need to do actual writing, writing, I'll use that if I'm writing white on black or if I need detailed white on black. I also have a. Uh, Have a aqua brush that's filled with Doc Martin, Doc PH Martin's uh, white, and this works very well. It just doesn't give me a super solid black unless I really go over it. So I tend to use this more for uh, detail and you know refining things. I use this for subtle details. I don't use this for I need bold stark white. If I need bold stark white, I either leave white space around or inside of what I'm drawing. Or if I, I'm going to be doing white on black, then I'll use the, uh, the Pentel Presto, or I'll use that Mol Molotow. But I ramble. <clears throat> so let's say that's panel one. And in this, like most of this is going to be kind of Photoshop, I'll leave it, it'll be black and white, but there'll be a lot of gray in here because he's under the water, deep under in its darkness. So if that's panel one. Panel two will be the start of the glow. In fact, what I should do real quick is come back to this little diagram I have and see how that pacing wise works with with this layout. So 
this is a full comic page. And yeah, a lot of times for me, thumbnailing is just working out all these different iterations. So even though I feel like, okay, I've got this that works, I know what I want the light to do, I'll still sort of double check it and make a quick, because, you know, this may take me, you know, three minutes to draw, maybe five minutes, but the time that I save in this when I'm actually lettering, when I'm actually doing my layouts and doing my final pages, the time that the three or five minutes it would take to just draw this diagram again and make sure I'm happy with how the values change across it is so worth it in comparison that, I mean, this is why I'm so big on thumbnails because it might seem like I'm doing way too much work at the beginning, but Drawing comics is a lot of work no matter what. Why not try and make it as painless as possible down the road by doing a little bit of extra grunt work at the start? So I very much like to thumbnail something to death until I've looked at a multiple, multiple... And even this, I know there are artists who thumbnail even more than I do. Um, if anything... I seem like I might be doing overkill compared to somebody who sits down and lays out their comic on the drawing board. There are people who, and that's, I think that's a skill set unto itself. If you have the picture, the whole story in your head, if you see it very clearly in your head, you can just take a piece of Bristol board, lay it down, rule out your panels and start drawing and, and work out the page, go for it. You're a better artist than I. I cannot. I need to think and think. I need to measure twice. I need to measure three times to cut once. You know, and something else that I mentioned about um, when I was talking about Jack Kirby and how he can tell very dynamic stories within simple boxes and simple um, page layouts. I do get innovative with my page layouts sometimes, but also one of the thing is, things is that this isn't an action sequence. This is a sequence of a person bleeding and thinking they're dying underwater, is talking to God. I want this to feel very peaceful and very stable. That's another reason for sticking with a simple grid. Doing things where I've got panels where the panel border is tilted to the side or panels are break, breaking open and exploding. You've got panels crashing into each other or having them actually fanning out all these crazy elaborate things. That's more appropriate for a fight scene, a chase scene, um, some sort of weird revelatory sequence that's happening in a story. What's happening in this moment has just as much importance in terms of how I organize my panels and the shape of those panels, the mood and the tone of it. That layout should be in line with that. It should be appropriate for it. It's like having the right kind of music playing underneath a romantic kiss. You don't want to have the Jaws music playing underneath that unless it's because a shadow is about to fall over them and someone's going to stab them. And consequently, you know, in horror movies, you can be playing really pleasant, happy music right before something happens. Um, and just have that. I see a, a couple of messages. I see, um, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm cutting from my ramble to address, uh, um, Draw to Write says, we like it when you ramble. Thank you. That It's convenient that you do because I ramble. And I see Ian Rock says his phone is about to die, but he got through most of the show. So if in case it cuts out, I'm glad you stopped by, man. It was good to see you. Thanks for, uh, for, for joining us. Um, but yes, one, having your panel borders, your panel does, your page design in terms of your, your layouts of your, your panels, having that be appropriate to the mood of it, you can also misdirect. In movies, you can misdirect where you can be playing really pleasant music either right before something action or horrific or dramatic is going to happen so that it throws people off so that it's a shock. Or, like I think about that movie, um, that John Travolta, Nicolas Cage movie, Face Off. I remember there's one scene where there's like, um, I think Junior Gershon's child um 
she's trying to protect her 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 kid and they're trying to get out from um there's a bunch of gangsters that are just shooting up her apartment and i believe that they're playing um it's a wonderful world in the background and the girl like maybe she has headphones on so that she's actually hearing the music i can't remember the context of it but what it is is that you have this very violent fight scene with very pleasant music playing at the same time also kind of like um uh, Kubrick, what's, um, Clockwork Orange, Singing in the Rain. I have, Singing in the Rain has never been more disturbing in, in its entire creation than, than in a Clockwork Orange. I believe it was Singing in the Rain. If it's a different song from a different musical, I apologize. I have actually only seen Clockwork Orange once. I do want to watch it again, but it's one of those movies that, it is an important movie, and it's a great movie, but it's not a fun movie, so it's a tough watch. But I believe Singing in the Rain is the movie. If someone, someone else will throw into the chat if I'm, I'm talking crazy talk. Um, but point being is that in music you can do that. In movies you can do that. I'm not sure within uh, comics if there's a way to use panel layout and panel design either to misdirect in terms of what's about to happen or in contrast to what's happening. I'm sure that other that creators have tried, and if people know of great, um, great examples, feel free to leave it in the video comments or in the chat if you're on here live. But I do believe it's possible. I just can't think of any examples off the top of my head right now. <sighs> so, and we're at uh, 56 minutes, and I usually wrap this up in an hour. So I'm gonna kind of doodle through these last couple of panels or maybe just one more panel. But if you guys have any more questions before we're done, please feel free to, uh, to throw it out there. Um, I see Madfit is in the chat and he said thumbnailing is thumbnailing and storyboards could be considered the same or used in the same capacity. I definitely do feel that thumbnailing and storyboards, well, it depends on... Uh, on the surface level, yes, they're the same. But there's a little bit of nuance in there. And I say nuance in the sense that, you know what, I've got a copy of uh, Morningstar Volume 1 here next to me. And so in the back of this book, I've got a bunch of uh, rough sketches and I show sort of my creative process let me see if I put in any layouts in here. I've got a bunch of thumbnails. I don't know if I put any layouts in the book. No, I just put thumbnails in here. <clears throat> oh, all right, well, let me just step away from the, the drawing table real quick and grab one of my sketchbooks so I can show you what I mean. So yes, in terms of storyboarding, you could say, you know, thumbnails are storyboards and storyboards are thumbnails. They're both rough sketches to communicate stories. That said, my thumbnails are these rough drawings of me just breaking down visually what are the story beats. That said, my layouts, my actual layouts are my rough pencils and as you can see these aren't I still don't consider these finished drawings because they're still pretty rough when you compare to in contemporary comics what the uh, the finished pencils look like before they they're sent off to an inker if you're working with an inker um, they're more refined than these so I don't necessarily consider these finished drawings but by the same token I think that if you were a storyboard artist and you were to say well thumbnails are not you could do storyboards that have this level of detail, but generally, depending on the project, if it's something where they want a high level of finish to their thumbnails, they might be more like what my layout drawings are. So I consider this, even though this isn't the finished book, I consider this a separate process from my thumbnailing. And I think that storyboard artists, it really just depends on who their clients are, their own personal creative process. But Storyboard artists could very much say, well, no, thumbnails and storyboards are not the same thing. They could say that their thumbnails are like my thumbnails 
and their storyboards are like my layouts or my finished drawings. And you know what? And there are some, if you're doing presentation boards where let's say you're pitching to an ad agency for a, for a commercial, for an ad campaign, your storyboards might look like a finished colored, penciled, inked, or painted comic. It might be a highly finished piece. So when I say, well, thumbnails and storyboards are the same thing, you can say that on the surface, but I think there's room for a lot of nuance and a lot of variation within that. Um, so let's see here. Right to Draw said, I read the, the book, A Clockwork Orange, <laughs> crazy, two exclamation marks, which I haven't read the book either, but considering the fact that I'm big on Audible, um, not a paid, paid promotion, but I love Audible and I listen to a lot of their, a lot of audio books on there. I should, I'm sure it's on there and I've never listened to the book. I've only watched the movie and I think it's be an interesting thing for me to listen to while I draw. I'm always looking for, for good stuff to listen to. And, uh, and Vince chimes in, um, on, on Clockwork Orange, when the gang is beating up the old man, the lead is singing, singing in the rain with his uh, kicks hitting certain beats of the song. Yes, all right. I'm pretty sure that Singing in the Rain was the... I'm, I'm glad my memory wasn't playing tricks. My mind wasn't playing tricks on me. Right to Draw also asks, um, doesn't a storyboard carry information, direction um, for lighting, tech, prop, prop placement? Yes, all those very true. Um, like I said, there's a lot of nuance in terms of what an actual storyboard has, whether it's a presentation board, whether these boards have, you know, you could have your, your lighting directions, lenses that, you know, noting of, of lenses for, um, for certain shots, a wide variety of information. So that's why on the surface, you can call them similar in the same way that someone could call my thumbnails and my layouts the same thing. There's a lot more information in my layouts than there are in my thumbnails. Same thing with uh, storyboards versus thumbnails. So that's it. We're at an hour here. So thank you to everyone who chimed in the chat. Thank you to everyone who is watching. Um, for those who want more videos, want to see more work behind the scenes, additional blog posts, head over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. For as little as $2 a month, you can sub subscribe to get extra bonus content. If you would like to read some of my comic books, you can go to comics.jeremy.net. And if you would like to buy some of my comics, go to amazon.jeremy.net. Thanks for watching. That's it for now.